morning and next Sunday, I'm doing a, a special, a kind of a special pair of sermons um, to give you an idea of um, some things that are some words that are used to describe our church. So many of you in here are soul winners, and we go out and we we pass out these invitations to our church. On the front of the invitation, you'll notice there's really three things listed here. It says Hold Fast Baptist Church, and it says Independent Fundamental Family Integrated. And I want to focus on for the next couple of weeks the first two words that are used to describe our church. And this morning. I want to focus on that first word, um, independent, and just talk about why we are independent this morning and you, what does that mean. So we're really going to talk about independence this morning and the importance of a church to be independent. And, you know, you're all, some of you are maybe like, yeah, America, we're talking about independence. I think you're going to be sorely disappointed with the sermon if that's your thought. But the point is, why are we independent? Why is that word used to describe Hold Fast Baptist Church, this local church? And this is actually something that I think is very important to understand. And it's something when I first got saved and started going to an independent Baptist church, I didn't really understand what the big deal was. I mean, it was a huge deal to an independent Baptist church that they are independent. What does that mean? It means that we are not, you know, you'll go out soul winning and people will ask you, well, what denomination are you? We are not a denomination. We are an independent Baptist church. Look, there are Baptist denominations. That's not us. And it's a big deal that we are independent. And I want to show you that it, that it is very important doctrinally that we remain that way and that all churches, that our true churches, are independent and not of denominations or ecumenical. Ecumenical meaning just that you, know, you get together with different denominations and all these types of things. And I was actually getting a tire fixed uh, a few weeks ago, right before soul winning, I was getting a tire fix on Saturday morning, and I had my Hold Fast Baptist Church shirt on, the one that has the Jesus made me a fisher of men on the back. I've had more comments on that, sh on that shirt, by the way, just wearing it in public, because uh, I got my tire fixed, and I was just complimenting the guy for fixing my tire so fast, and a guy that was waiting for his car to get fixed came up to me, and he says, oh, uh, I'm a Christian too, and he's like, where do you go to church? And I had an invitation. I gave him an invitation to the church. He's like, we should get, and he told me that where he went to church, which is an Assemblies of God church, you know, a Pentecostal denomination, and he's like, we should get our churches together. You should get your pastor to call my pastor. We should get our churches together, and we should do activities and things like that. Never will that happen, ever. I didn't say that to him. I was very polite, and I was nice. And I was like, oh, great, check out the invitation and all that. And I was very polite, but we would never do something like that. You say, why? Because we're independent. That's why. You say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? First of all, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. So the end of Ephesians chapter 5, it gives us this structure. At the end of Ephesians chapter 5, you know, the Bible shows us this structure for the family, and it relates this structure to the family, to the structure of the church, and who's in charge, and what is the, it's an organizational structure, is what we're looking at at the end of Ephesians chapter 5. And look, the world today rejects all of this, from the family to the church, and we're going to talk about this. So there's this idea, look, most of you know that I grew up Lutheran. All right, when it, when it comes down to it, it's, it's, just, it's pretty much Catholic. It's the same thing. I used to call being Lutheran, we're like diet Catholic, is what I would say. Because it's basically all the same stuff, except I used to even joke with people when I was growing up as a teenager. Everyone was like, what's the Lutheran? What's the difference between Lutherans and Catholics? I'm like, Lutherans are basically like Catholics that don't have to go to church. That's, that's how I would explain it. <laughs> but anyway, I grew up Lutheran, and there was this idea, every single service we would recite what is called the Nicene Creed. And I, I mean, we had to memorize it and every single, it's not hard to memorize something that you repeat every single Sunday uh, of your life. But there's this line in the Nicene Creed where it says, I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. And a lot of Lutherans would be like, oh, it says Catholic, but we're Lutheran. Well, the word Catholic simply means universal. That's what the word actually means means. So there's this idea that is pro almost universally accepted amongst Christianity today that there is this idea of a universal church, of a Catholic, meaning universal, church. But 
And what they use for this doctrine is Ephesians 5, verse number 25 through 27. Look down at the Bible here where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, meaning the church, with the washing of water by the word, verse 27, then he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So look, I agree. The church should be holy. The church should be without blemish. This is a true statement, Ephesians chapter 5. But what this is not saying is that there is some universal, invisible church made up of all of those who profess Christ or whatever the definition of, of Christian is to that person. So the question becomes, since this is the verse, these are the verses used to justify the doctrine of this universal church, meaning that there is the church is this invisible number of people that follow some specific doctrine, which is different to anyone you ask, by the way, and it's just only God knows who's part of this universal church. But that is not what the Bible is teaching here. The Bible is simply saying that the church, whatever that is, is to be holy, is to be subject to Christ. That's what this is saying. So the question becomes, what is the church? What is the church? That's, what, that's the only question we need to answer here. Look at, um, go to Revelation chapter 1. Think about the letters of Paul. Think about the letters of Paul throughout the New Testament. The letters of Paul are written to what? They're written to churches. They're written to, written to local groups of believers in certain areas. They're, they're written to Rome. They're written to Corinth. They're written to Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica. They're written to all these different churches. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 4. Revelation is addressed to who? Look at verse number 4 of Revelation chapter 1. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you, and peace from which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Look, the first point is, if there was a universal invisible church, these Bible, these Bible authors here, you know, that were inspired by the Holy Spirit could have saved themselves a lot of words. I mean, why would they say to the seven churches? Why would Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, and all these letters to the churches, why would they say to the seven churches? And, the, and, and Jesus talking to, you know, all of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are, are, are red words. They're Jesus speaking to these churches. And he says, to the church at. To the church at. You say, why would he have done that? Why wouldn't he have just said to the church? I write this to the church. But he didn't. It's always talking to a local group of believers. That obviously applies to us, a local group of believers. But the point is, is this Paul could have saved a lot of ink if there was a universal church. He would have just said to the church, to the church, to the, to the universal church. It's also a doctrine that people want to believe because it justifies them not having to go to church. Because a church is a local group of believers that meet at a specific location. And you'll meet people out there that are just like, oh, you know, I, I am the church. I don't have to go to church because I am the church. Just like me walking around by myself, I'm the church. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible. 99% of the time that the Bible uses the word church, it is talking about a specific locality. And the other times, as in Ephesians chapter 5, it is talking about the organizational structure of that organization in every locality that it's at. He's talking generally to, you know, the church. When he says, I mean, first of all, who is he talking to in Ephesians chapter 5? He's talking to the church at Ephesus. And he's talking about how that specific church should be organized, which obviously applies to every church at every locality. It is not anywhere near talking about some kind of universal or invisible church. Now, who is the church? Go to Acts chapter 20. Actually, go to Acts chapter 2, or just look at the front of your bulletin. So, who is the church? What is the church made up of? Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, or just look at the front of your bulletin. The Bible is talking here about, Acts chapter 2 is all about the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. So, again, it's a specific location. It is the first actual church 
that formed after Jesus Christ went um, ascended into heaven. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 47. It says, praising God, they had just gotten all these people saved in Jerusalem through this great miracle of speaking all these different languages and being able to, he to reach all these different people from all these different nations. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It's talking about every single time they're preaching the gospel daily in that location, that church is growing and growing and growing. And we studied through the book of Acts, and it wasn't until they were persecuted in Jerusalem that, by the way, anytime Christians are persecuted throughout real, the, the real believers are persecuted throughout history, there's a great example of this in the book of Acts, Christianity just spreads. It just gets stronger. It just grows more and more and more. But if you remember, the church at Antioch actually formed because of the persecution at Jerusalem. They were chased out. They formed the church in Antioch. That became the base, the home base of Paul's um, missionary journeys where he did what? He started all these other churches. And that's exactly what the book of Acts talk about. You'd think that the universal church would be mentioned somewhere in the Bible if it was actually a thing. It is not. A church is a local group of believers. It says, added to the church daily, what? Such as should be saved. So the church is a group of people that are saved. That's what the church is. Well, that doesn't mean we're not going to have visitors come in that aren't saved. But that's why when people do come visit, I mean, we, we try to give the gospel to everybody that comes to visit this church. It's a, it's a normal thing because we want to add people to the church as such that should be saved. But the point is, a church, the church, is a local group of saved people. And this church is no different. Go to Acts chapter 20. Go to Acts chapter 20 in verse number 28. I'll just give you one more verse on this. But look at Acts chapter 20 in verse number 28. The Bible says, take heed, in verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God. What is the church of God? Which he hath purchased with his own Blood, talking about a local group of, again, people that were purchased with Christ's own blood, believers. Talking about a local group of believers. So this idea that there's this universal church that is just all-inclusive of everything, no matter what is going on, is just not in the Bible at all. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that certain types of even believers, if they're doing certain things, are not to be allowed in the church. There's very strict you know, management that needs to be taken, uh, you know, of the church. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. So the church is a local group of believers. The Bible talks about churches. And in Ephesians chapter 5, it is talking about how that local church, how a local church is to be organized, how it is to, you know, operate. What is the authority structure? That's what Ephesians chapter 5 is explaining. And it's also relating that authority structure of how that local church is to be, it's relating that to the family as well. That's why if you go to a wedding and you go to, especially a Baptist wedding, maybe modern weddings don't really read much of Ephesians chapter 5 anymore, but if you go to a Baptist wedding, one of the things uh, uh, that a, that a Bible-believing pastor will, will read from is Ephesians chapter 5 because it talks about the authority structure in a family as it relates to husbands and wives. Are you in Matthew chapter 16? So what is the... What is the organizational structure of a local church supposed to look like? And the point of the sermon this morning, and what I want to show you this morning, is why it is vital and important that churches, real churches, are independent. That's the point of the sermon this morning. And the irony, by the way, the irony of Ephesians chapter 5 is just like the irony of so much other false doctrine that's taught out there. Ephesians chapter 5, if you actually read it, it is talking, it literally, it, it's teaching against denominations and against churches being ecumenical. It's, it's telling, you know, the, the believers in Ephesus what a local church should be structured like. Look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18. The Bible says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Talking about you know, the local church, the, this, this organizational structure that is made up of believers, Jesus is saying, we're going to build this upon the rock. Who's the rock? It's Jesus, not Peter, folks. Amen. 
Jesus is the rock. All right? Jesus is the rock. Jesus is saying if you follow the way that you, that you should structure the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If the church follows, if the local church follows the Bible, of which Jesus Christ is the Bible, the Word became flesh, is Jesus Christ, and if a church follows that, if a local group of believers follows exactly what the Bible says about a church, nothing can prevail against it. That is what the Bible is saying. That's what Jesus tells Peter here. He's saying, look, but there is no mention of denominations in the Bible. There is no mention of it. There's no mention of, of presidents, vice presidents, CEOs, all these different, there's no mention of cardinals, there's no mention of popes, all these extra church um, authority figures in the Bible. There's no mention of the church on earth, there's no mention of the universal church, but that's why so many denominations, by the way, as a matter of fact, every single denomination claims to be the true church when there's only churches. You say, I mean, what's the big deal? And like I said at the beginning of the sermon, I didn't even r really think this was a huge deal coming from Lutheranism to, you know, once I got saved, to becoming an independent Baptist. I, I was kind of like, what's the big deal? That's the goal of the sermon this morning is to show you what the big deal is. What is the doctrine of the universal church actually doing? And who's behind it? Who's behind it? First of all, ask yourself this question. Find, find me one denomination today that has not corrupted the gospel. Find me one. You say, what about the Baptists? There's Baptist denominations. The, yeah, the biggest, what's the biggest Baptist denomination you can think of? The Southern Baptist denomination in the United States. It's the biggest Baptist denomination. They are not independent. They have a large management structure above all of their churches. There's presidents, there's vice presidents, there's all these things. And guess what? They have a false gospel. They, they teach that you need to repent of your sins to be saved. Look, it's worse than Pentecostalism. If you're going to pick a false gospel, that's the worst one. Meaning you have to turn from all your sins to be saved? No one's going to heaven, folks. Go join a Southern Baptist church, and they teach literally that you have to turn from all your sins to be saved. Guess what? We're all going to hell. That's what that means. Good luck. Stop sinning. Hey, go stop sinning for one week and then tell me about this denomination and their gospel. It's impossible. It's not in the Bible. Every single denomination today has a false gospel. As a matter of fact, when you go out soul winning, if you're an experienced soul winner, you'll realize that there are other churches out there that are not independent Baptists that have a correct gospel, but the vast majority of the time, what are they? They are non-denominational churches. And many times, those churches, if you study it out, those churches, they came from being independent Baptist, and they just dropped Baptist from the name because they, they became liberal. But they had, the, they had the original, they have the correct gospel. They're not doing anything. They're liberal. They're watered down. They're not preaching anything. But they have the correct gospel. They're non-denominational. And that is something that you will see all the time. Look, with the denominations, you would think there'd be one that has a correct gospel, but show me one. What they're trying to do is put you in this box and control the way you think. And I want to show you this morning that by becoming a denomination and by converging into these organizations that are extra biblical, what they are doing is they're getting people to set aside their personal convictions. They're getting people to set aside doctrine. And the first thing that gets set aside, folks, is the gospel. This is the problem. See, the problem is, with organizations like denominations, I mean, first of all, the Bible teaches certain things, but they all make sense when you just think it through. Everything that God structures in the Bible for the family, for our nation, for everything, it all makes sense when you think it through. Denominations and all these universal structures, the, the problem is this, is that corruption spreads easier in those structures. You think about a denomination, you say, why is every denomination corrupt? I was Missouri Synod Lutheran. And every single Missouri, there's, yes, there's many denominations inside the Lutheran structure. Many, many. So many, I probably can't even name them all. There's many denominations. But every single one of those denominations has a false gospel. 
You say, why? Because Satan loves that because he can just corrupt one person, then he gets all these people. He can corrupt the president, he can corrupt the top of the organization, and he gets all these people. I mean, of course the denomination will say, yeah, we're the one true church, but every denomination is corrupt because it's an easy structure to corrupt. This is why. Some denominations don't even claim to follow Bible doctrine anymore. But if a denomin the point is this, if a denomination goes bad, all of the churches in that denomination follow. It creates an organized structure of power outside the biblical teaching of the individual church. It's not in the Bible. And whenever we go outside the Bible, remember what Jesus said to Peter. If you base your church on the Bible, nothing can prevail against it. If we start operating outside the Bible, all bets are off. This is why we must remain independent. CEOs, CFOs, COOs, VPs, all these different things, these are not structures that are in the Bible for the church. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 5. So what is the structure inside the church? What is the structure inside an independent church? Because the Bible lists that for us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start at verse number 22. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 22. The Bible says this. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, as unto the Lord. So this is just, it's talking about the structure of a family here. It's saying um, wives are to submit themselves unto their husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. This is a family structure here. This is not hard to understand. Even as Christ is the head of the church. So the Bible here is using the relationship between Christ and the church, the local church, as an example of, as, as a mirror of what the family is supposed to look like. So we're talking about the church at this point. I'll talk about the family in a few minutes, but who's the head of this church? Jesus. Jesus is the head of this church, not me. Jesus is the one that is in charge of this church. So who is the, who is the local church subject to? Jesus Christ. Who else? No one. The president, the CEO, the board of directors? No, Jesus Christ. The cardinal? No, look at verse number 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one fle flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. So we learn in Ephesians chapter 5 that the only person... I mean, people use this to teach denominations and teach a universal church doctrine. It's literally saying, no, you shouldn't do that. That's not the way it is. The only person that the local church is subject to is Jesus Christ. But now look at 1 Peter chapter 5. You say, okay, um, we're all supposed to just follow um, Jesus and, and there's supposed to be no structure inside the church. Well, no, look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, but the point is, there's nothing outside the church. This is the first point. It's the church, the local church, and Jesus. That's it. Now, inside the church, God gives very specific rules. But church, Jesus. There's no outside, there's no outside influence on this local church. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders which are among you I exhort. Now, in the New Testament, elder, bishop, and pastor are used as synonyms. They're the same thing. They're interchangeable. So when it's talking about the elders which are among you I exhort, he's talking about the pastors, the leaders of a church, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 2. He's, he's talking to the pastors of the local churches here, the elders of the local churches, and he tells them to do what? Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. He's saying feed the flock of God with what? This is what I'm supposed to feed you with. This is a direct commandment from the Bible of the pastor to feed the flock of God. Feed the Bible. In other places in the Bible, it says I'm supposed to feed you everything in here. Some is milk, some is meat. Some is easy to understand easy to take, some is hard to take. That's why some sermons you walk out of here, you feel like you got kicked in the chest by a horse because I'm supposed to feed you everything. Look, there's times I, I flip through the Bible and I'm like, 
oh man, I got to preach that. That's going to be tough. But I'm not, res I'm not responsible to tell you what you want to hear. I'm responsible to tell you everything. I'm supposed to feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So here, there's some specific instructions to the pastor here. It's saying, don't, don't, uh, you can't do it by constraint. You know, this is why um, pastors uh, add to the gospel. This is a pastor that gets up and says, if you don't come to church three times a week, you're going to go to hell. If you don't listen to what I say, you're going to go to hell. If you don't like this sermon today, are you really saved? Look, you know what that's doing? That's taking constraint over the people. There's nothing I can say that will make you go to hell if you are saved this morning. If you have trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that it is not of works that you are saved, and you have taken the trust off yourself, and you put it all on Jesus Christ, there is nothing I can say that can change that. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, not by me. There's nothing I can say. So as much as I get up here and I want you to follow the Bible, I tell you what the Bible says. You implementing that is, is up to you and your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Not willingly, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. I'm not supposed to be up here being a pastor for money, to get rich, which from, for a Bible-preaching church is, is a ridiculous, uh, is, is a ridiculous uh, notion in itself. But I'm not up here trying to just say sweet, nice things to just grow this church as fast as possible. Do you know that there's things that are preached here that actually make people not come back? Because it's hard for people to hear some things from the Bible. But it's not my responsibility to preach nice things and just get up here and tell you a great message every single morning that if you come to church and you do these things, if you put money in the plate, everything's going to be great in your life. This is Joel Osteen. What is he doing? He's just telling the people what they can hear for filthy lucre's sake so, he, so they can make money, just get rich. The Bible's saying, no, pastor, you cannot do that. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. Again, that's going into that, you know, threatening the people with their salvation and all this type of thing, but being examples to the flock. The pastor is under very strict qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus, other places in the Bible. But look at this in verse number 4. It says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So the pastor of the church is the under-shepherd. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. We're talking about the pastor being the under-shepherd of the flock. But it can't be by force or threat. It can't be for money. You know, this is, the, this is the Pentecostal today, folks. The Pentecostal pastor that gets up and has whatever... Uh, whatever list of sins he doesn't want the people to do, and he puts that on the list that will make you go to hell. That's taking, you know, that's taking, you know, God's people and, and just and, and just making them follow you by constraint. Look, it, it's culty. People, say, I mean, works-based salvation. I don't care. Every single Christian denomination that has a false gospel with some form of work salvation, it's culty. It's culty saying if you don't do these things, you're going to go to hell. Listen to me, or you're going to go to hell. That's that's culty. Well, it's, taking, it's taking God's people by constraint. It's being lords over God's heritage is exactly what it is. Now turn to Acts chapter 6. But the point is, is the structure inside the church is there's, there's to be an under-shepherd. There's a chief shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, and there is an under-shepherd. And he and he alone, he, by the way, it can't be a she, all right? I mean, it can't be a she. The Bible is like so clear. On the qualification for a pastor, I think it says like six times in just in like five verses that it needs to be a man. And then you get some, some woman pastor that stands up and is like, I'm the pastor of this church. I, I don't know what. It's not a church, but you're the pastor of something. It's not a church that Jesus would consider a church. Look at Acts chapter 6. Look at Acts chapter 6. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, remember where we have to do things the way the Bible says? It's important. Look at verse number one. It says, In those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows, widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So this church is growing and growing and growing, and there's things that are being neglected in the church. There's people that need to be visited. There's people that need someone to talk to. And it, the pastors can't get to everybody. 
Look at verse number 2. It says, The twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually in prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So this is the first deacons of the church here. This is the first deacons of the church. So there's a structure of a pastor being an under-shepherd, and then when the church gets big enough, look, we don't have a deacon here, because we don't have a church that's large enough for a deacon, but an independent Baptist church that grows to the point of needing someone to help with the daily ministration of things, visitation of people, where it's too much for one man to get to everyone, that's where the deacons come in. And guess what? The deacons are to be what? Men, again, and they're also to be have specific qualifications, and those qualifications, by the way, are exactly the qualifications of a pastor. Exactly the same thing. But that's the structure. It's pastor-led there's Jesus Christ, it's led by a pastor, there's deacons when necessary for support. And look, even, uh, even in our church here, we don't have deacons, but you know, I have, there's Jesus had an inner circle of Peter, James, and John. We have um, two trusted individuals at this church where I meet with them twice a year and go over business things in the church, I go over the financials, with them in the church, just to show them that we have every loop closed in, in, the, in the financials of the church. These are things that I do to, to make sure that everything is decent and in order. These are things, these are men that I've told them their job is also, you know, if I need, um, you know, a question to ask about, you know, hey, you know, how do you think, um, you think this looks good or you think we should tighten up here or there? They're not voting and telling me what to preach and what to do and how to lead the church. But even Solomon had counselors. Even Solomon had counselors. And especially when it comes to finances and things like that in the church, I think it's very important just so people in the church know that there's that structure there. Okay? But look, the bottom line is this. This is a pastor-led church. It is independent from any denomination, and it is led by a pastor because the pastor is the only one responsible. The pastor is the one when it gets to the time where, you know, Jesus is going to come and say, how did Hold Fast Baptist Church, you know, run itself, and how did things go there, and, and what went wrong, and what didn't, look, I'm responsible. I'm responsible. That's it. That's why there's qualifications, and there's very specific instructions. The pastor is subject to Christ, not a president or a CEO or whatever. I mean, what a dangerous situation for me that would be. If I was subject to some president that was telling me something, and it was it, it, eventually it would be uh, against the Bible, and I'm responsible for it. Look, I fear the Lord. No man, and, and you know, the Bible even says I shouldn't even fear your faces when you hear something that you don't like to hear. So I fear the Lord because I am, I am responsible to answer to Jesus Christ for how things went here. Now, I mean, the, the obvious question comes in your head is like, will all pastors do good? Well, no, and the Bible talks about that. No, all pastors will not do good. There are pastors that will, and look, I'm telling you, turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. And, but this just proves, showing that there are pastors in the Bible that the Bible talks about, that God talks about, that don't do the right thing and don't do well. First of all, no pastor is perfect, but what if a pastor starts preaching things that are outside the Bible? What if a pastor starts doing things that make him no longer meet those qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and other parts of the Bible? What then? What then? Could that happen? Look, it does happen, and I'm sure you can think of, of cases where it did happen. That pastors go bad and do horrible, terrible things. It happens, unfortunately. But I'm going to show you this morning that it just backs up the fact that churches should be independent, the fact that it does sometimes happen. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse number 1. First of all, look who the woe is upon here. It says, Woe un be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors 
that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith who? Saith the CEO? Saith the board of directors of, of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod? No, saith the Lord. It is the Lord that is going to take care of that situation. And look, I'm sure if you can think of a situation where a pastor did go bad or do terrible, horrible things, the Lord did take care of that situation. Every single time I've seen it happen, the Lord took care of it. Look, it wasn't pretty, but the Lord took care of it. But back on this, but back on this idea of an independent church, okay, a pastor goes bad. You know what, though? That church goes bad. And you know what? Not even all the, necessarily all the people in the church go bad because another pastor can come in and take over you know, that flock and feed that flock properly. It's, it's possible. But you know what? Even if that whole church went bad, say there's a pastor that goes and declares himself to be Jesus or something, which happens. <laughs> Not independent Baptist people that we know, but it happens, and then people follow that. Look, it's that one church that's gone bad. It didn't just make everybody else go bad. Because we're all subject, every individual independent Baptist church is subject to Jesus. Jesus is never going to go bad. That's protection. And look, if you're in an independent Baptist church, and look, including this one, I start preaching a false gospel, get out of here. I start preaching things that aren't in the Bible, hit the door, get out. Because I'm not going to do that. I, I, you know, I promise. <laughs> but the point is, is that every single individual church is subject to Jesus. We're not subject to what some wicked person that calls himself a pastor over here does or in another town over. So it doesn't, it doesn't destroy us. The independence of the church is protection for God's people. And this is why God does it. You know who, you know who wants to converge everything and merge everything? and get every, everybody together, and get all the denominations together, and get everything, you know, let's all come together. Have you heard this before? You know whose plan that is? That's Satan's plan. That's the plan of the devil in this world today. Look, it is Satan's plan to converge everything. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? No, look, this is the problem with corporations. This is the problem with corporations. Corporations become this conglomerate of boards of directors and presidents and CEOs. And you know what it does? It removes individual responsibility from what a business does. It's convergence. It takes the morality out of everything. Because you know if you have individual businesses, then a lot of times you'll get an individual business that maybe does you know, some kind of service, but the owner of the company is responsible for what his company does, and he's like, no, no, we're not going to go and do that for that immoral cause or whatever that is. And they can make that decision as the owner of the company. But as soon as you start getting these corporations and conglomerates together, the individual people with morals get further and further away from the decisions of the organization. That's how you get corporations that are like, they literally have, literally have um, board of directors meetings and they're like, hey, whatever helps us sell more bombs, that's what we're for. And they could care less about what's, what, they're, what the materials that they make are used for or who they're being sold to. Look, an individual owner would say, I'm responsible for what this company does. Just as a church has a pastor who is responsible to Jesus Christ for what he does. It's easy to corrupt organizations like this. Not only that, but I mean, it gets so big. You know, these, these, these organizations get so big that even good people can work there and feel like they're detached from the evil that is happening, you know, at that place. I mean, there's evil organizations that, you know, in our government where I'm sure there's a lot of good people that work there, but they just detach themselves from it because, you know, but, but here's what happens. As the organization gets more converged, it gets more evil. And as it gets more evil, there becomes less good people that works there. And this cycle just continues and continues and continues. The perfect example of this type of convergence is the public school system. Where you have an, an organization that is completely converged. It is completely centrally controlled by the Department of Education, this federal 
this federal government controlled program. That's why, look, and converged organizations, they are designed, Satan designs them so it is nearly impossible to change them from a local level. Like, oh, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be a converged school system anymore. I want to have a local school that follows the school, that follows the morals of this local community. This is how our country was founded on this philosophy. But no, it's central. You can't change it. That's why all these people that go into school board meetings and all this stuff, I'm like, just, get, just save your hot air. It's designed so you can't change it. It's a central machine. It's completely converged. But guess what happened? You'll be hard-pressed to find a Bible-believing Christian teacher today in the public school system. Because there's no Bible-believing Christian teacher that's going to go and teach all this transgender, transgenderism and all this perversion and evolution and there's no God and all this kind of stuff. There's no Christian teacher that's going to do that, that's truly saved, that believes the Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Satan tries to... So, Satan's trying to converge organizations. He's trying to converge... He's converged the school system. He's, you know what? He's trying to converge nations, too. He's trying to converge everything today. But what does God say? Does God want nations converged? Let's look at what God wanted for his nation. I don't know where God's nation is today in, in the world, but God had a nation back in the Old Testament, and let's see what he told them. When they went into the promised land, did he say, hey, you need to get together with these people. Your diversity is your strength. You need to get together with these people. You need to get along. You need to embrace your differences. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look at verse number 1. Satan is the one pushing convergence in this world. God is against it. And if Satan's pushing it, you know God is on the opposite side. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 1. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. God is giving instructions before they go into the promised land. Let's see if these instructions are unclear or gray in any way. When the Lord God, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. God says, I don't want any of them left. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. He's saying, you go in there and you destroy all these people. He say, that's mean. Hey, that's the Bible. That's the Bible. And the Bible explains why that happened, by the way. These people were sacrificing their children. These people were doing evil, wicked, murderous, perverse things. And God says, go in there, wipe them all out. He's like, and then he, and then he just kind of goes into, he, he, knows the, he, he knows they won't listen to him. Don't make covenants with them. Don't make deals with them. What do they do? They go in and they start making deals. And they're like, hey, we can make money if we tax these people. We can make deals with these people and they'll pay us money if we don't destroy them. He's like, don't marry into them. Don't marry their daughters. Don't let their daughters marry your sons. You say, why? It says, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. He's like, you'll join them. You'll become like them. God is saying, stay divided. And destroy these. Stay divided or the anger that I have shown against these nations, I will show it will come upon you. And then you will be destroyed as well. Thus ye shall deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, and burn their graven image with fi images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. You see what he's saying here? He's like, you should be separated unto me. You should be apart from these people above all, that are peop all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Look, it is the Antichrist that is going to try to converge nations, the Bible teaches. It is globalism that the Antichrist is going to be pushing, not God. It is not God that wants... The, the, the world will all come together. That will happen only under one king, and that is Jesus Christ. But it is the Antichrist that is going to be making all these treaties amongst all these nations and a covenant with many that he will fight a world war through, and that will be a, a world, one world government. It is the Antichrist that is going to be pushing 
that kind of philosophy. And who's he run by? He's run by Satan. Satan is his master. How about this? Satan, you know what Satan's trying to do? Satan's trying to converge families too. Satan's trying to destroy the structure that God's, God's putting forth for families. The very specific structure that we looked at in Ephesians chapter 5. You say, in, in Galatians chapter 3, we looked at last week, it says, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Look, we're not talking about the value of people to God here. We're not talking about a woman's value to God or a man's value to God. We're talking about the specific structure that God has put forth for a family. That there is to be a husband and a wife, and the wife is to be subject and in reverence to her husband, meaning the husband is in charge. The, the home is not supposed to be a democracy. You're like, oh, democracy is great, America. By the way, we're not a, we're not a, a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. People need to read more. We're all like, we're all about democracy here. I'm like, not in this country. We've never been a democracy. Democracies are terrible. Yet we try to push democracy around the world. And we support nations that you know, aren't even democracies that have like suspended the ability to vote. It's weird. People need to read more. But back to the family. Satan is trying to converge the family. You should not sit in your house around the dinner table and, and be like, everyone's in charge here. Let's, let's decide what's going to happen. Let's all take a vote. That is not how the family is supposed to run. The husband is in charge. If everyone is charged, this is what Satan knows. If everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. Satan knows this. If, you are, if you're ever at work and, and you ever get in a situation where everyone's like, yeah, we'll all take care of that, just remember, it's never going to get done. Because unless somebody's in charge or somebody's responsible, it's never going to get done. The husband is the head. He's the responsibility. He's the responsible factor. He's the one that God is holding accountable. So when the family falls apart, the husband can't sit there and say, oh, it's her fault. You're in charge. If the ship sinks, that's on you because you allowed it to sink. You know, it's, it's his responsibility to make sure that the children are raised. You know what homeschooling is, by the way? It's taking yourself out of this converged system that is the public school, and you're becoming an independent system. And that's what God, you're separating from that converged organization. This is what Satan is teaching today. It takes a village to raise a child. No, it doesn't. It takes my, my wife, uh, who is subject to me, and us teaching those children the Bible and raising them up according to what God says. That's what it takes. It doesn't take a village. Look at what the village is doing. Right. I hope it doesn't take a village to raise a, a child. This idea of convergence is being pushed on everyone in our society today. This is why you hear all the things that we need to put aside our differences. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 13. Our diversity, our diversity is our strength. That's, that's my favorite one. And then what they'll do is if you say, no, I, I, can, you, can someone tell me how our diversity is our strength? Can you tell me how that works? What they'll do is if you go against that, they'll be like, oh, you're a racist. Look around you in this church. Race is nothing. Race is made up to put you in a box. Amen. The Bible says there's one race. We are all of one blood. We're not talking about when God is against the nations. He's not talking about what skin color they are. It's what they were doing. It's what their culture was. Their culture was against them. Ruth was a Moabitess. It had nothing to do with the blood running through your veins, the color of your skin, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes. Nothing. It has everything to do with worshiping the one true God or turning against him. That's all it is. But this idea that all cultures are equal that's being pushed today. Nothing is wrong. There is no, there is no taboo. There's no, this is my favorite one, there's no shame anymore. I'm reading a book right now that most people in my family have read, so I, I figured I'd read it, and it's really good. It's really good. I don't read a lot of books like this, but I'm reading Pride and Prejudice. Raise your hand if you've read it. Oh, man, more people need to read this book. It's, it's pretty good. It's a fictional story, but it's really good. And one of the, one of the most interesting things about the book to me, it's based in like 1820s, the early 1800s in England. And one of the most interesting things reading this book, looking at it through a biblical lens, is how, like, what people thought was shameful back then. And I'm just like, I'm just loving it. Because, I mean, there was a situation where a man was going to go up and talk to another man. 
And, and some woman says to him, you can't do that. You can't just go up and talk to that man without being properly introduced. I'm just like, I'm just like this is just great. There's all this formality and all this, this shame with someone that is considered to be, you know, in fornication. And, and there's, it's just like, we need, to bring, we need to make shame great again is what we need to make. The Bible talks about shame all the time. Shame is a good thing, but people tell you, oh, there's nothing wrong with anything. Anything that you do is right. This is, this is what pastors will teach today. They'll get up and every, you're great. You're great and everything that you do is great. I mean, just they take the Bible and they just throw it out the window. They have a fake Bible anyway. But nothing is wrong, nothing's taboo. But look, shame is a good thing. We're, I was driving to church this morning with Jacob, and there's a guy that walked across the street. We're at a stoplight. He walks across the street. He wasn't even a, a, a homeless guy. But it was some guy that was just going to a coffee shop, and he just got out of bed and just, like, literally must have just got out of bed and just walked right out of his house and just, like, went to the coffee shop. I mean, he's in his pajamas. His hair is, like, looks like it just blew up this way. And just, like, just, who cares? And you go to Walmart. Who cares? Nobody cares. There's nothing that's shameful anymore. People walk around naked today, according to what the Bible says naked is. You're like, that's not naked. You know, naked is what the Bible says it is. Right. It's not what you think it is. You know, what your, what, what your society taught you today. Are you in Luke chapter 13? It is Satan that is trying to converge everything. In order to converge, in order to be part of a converged organization, whatever it is, you have to let your principles go. This is the problem. And God is saying, no. Look at Luke chapter 13. Look at verse number 23. Luke chapter 13, verse number 23. The Bible says, Then one said unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say, to you, say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. The Bible says in another, uh, Jesus says it another way. He says, Broad is the way that leads to destruction. So, let me give you one last point to think about this morning. Until Jesus is in charge, you say, okay, maybe we should push for a government that, that just like, that has, you know, independent Baptists as their official religion. I would never want a government to endorse any religion, and it's because of Luke chapter 13. As a matter of fact, if you like the First Amendment and the fact that we have freedom of speech in this country, you should go thank an independent Baptist today. Because it is the independent Baptist that that had the first idea for the First Amendment, that the government should not endorse a religion. And the reason that I would never want a government to endorse a religion at all, ever, is because of Luke chapter 13, because the religion that they endorse will always be the wrong one. Always. Until Jesus Christ rules and reigns on this earth. The Independent Baptist in the 1780s was given a seat at the table. Like, the government's going to endorse five denominations, and we would like you to be one of them. And they're like, no, we don't want any part of it. We don't want any part of it. Why? Because we're independent. We're subject to Christ, not you. Amen. Nothing gets in between the church and Jesus. Nothing. And they said no, and that's where they came up with the idea of the First Amendment, that people would... I don't want the public school. Everybody's like, oh, we took the air out of the schools in the 70s, and that's what's wrong with the public school. I don't want, if my kid was in public school, I wouldn't want the public school teaching anything that having anything to do with religion to my children. Why? Because they'll teach the wrong thing. That's why. It's a converged organization. It will never teach the truth. And Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 13 that the gospel will never be the majority opinion. So when you go out soul winning and you realize that the vast majority of people are not saved, Jesus told you. It will never be the majority opinion. Straight is the gate, meaning narrow. It doesn't mean hard. It's very easy to be saved. Accepting a gift is very, very, very easy. It says narrow. Other modern Bible versions say hard is the way. Like you got to do a lot of work. You know, work is hard. It's not hard. It's narrow is the way. Turn to Acts chapter 7. The gospel, the word of God, is never going to be the majority of opinion. Why? Because it offends people. That's why. Because people hear it, and they get upset. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, one of the first deacons, gives this beautiful sermon. And what, what effect does it have on people when he gives this sermon? Look at verse 54 
of Acts chapter 7. The Bible says when they heard these things, what? They, they stood up and gave them a standing ovation. It says when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth, and then they killed him right after this. It cuts to the heart, and today is no different than in Jesus' day. So the best that we can hope for, folks, until Jesus comes back, is for independent thinking to thrive, actually. As we go out and we talk to people about the gospel, look, I want that person that I'm talking to to be an independent thinker. I want that person to not be in some converged, you know, box that somebody has put them in. I want them to be an independent thinker. Why? Because the gospel's the best idea. That's why. It makes no sense, all these other religions. And really, there's only two. There's works-based salvation, and there's the gospel. That's it. The gospel is the best idea. And guess what? It's the only thing that makes any sense. So I want people to be independent thinkers when I go knock on their door. And you know what? If I find somebody who's an independent thinker and thinks about the things that they're being told, they're going to get saved. I'm fine competing in a free market of ideas as long as I have the Bible. Satan is about convergence in everything. It's, it's simply because he can't get everybody on his side. So he converges everything to corrupt the many through a few. That's what Satan is doing in this world. Turn to Luke chapter 12 and we'll end here. See, God is about division. You're not going to hear that a lot today. Jesus Christ is about division. He's about being divided. It is a fake Jesus that is taught that, oh, you need to love everybody and everything that anyone does at any time. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. God is about division and separation today. And you know what? Jesus knows that not everyone will accept him. He knows that too. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse number 51. Luke chapter 12, verse number 51 the Bible says, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I mean, I guess to be a, a modern preacher, that's as far as you've got to take that verse right there. See, Jesus, he wants peace on earth. Jesus, he wants to bring everybody together. There's a question mark after that statement. He says, do you think I came here to bring everybody together and just make everybody at peace with each other? Later in the, in the, in the Bible, he says, no, I came to bring a sword. Jesus didn't bring a sword. He's saying to the disciples, I'm bringing, people are going to take a sword after you. But look what he says. He says, I tell you nay, but rather division. And then he talks about even own, people in their own houses and their own families will be divided. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, come out from among them and be ye separate. The Christian, against what Satan wants, is to be divided, is to be separate. Look, that's a hard thing to teach today. People don't want to hear that today. But you know what? As a Christian, as a Bible-believing Christian this morning, you need to stay divided. You need to stay separate. You know what? You need to point out weirdness. You need to point out weirdness. You need to not, because the more we see weirdness, the more our kids will get used to it. We need to point out weirdness. When you see some guy getting pushed down the, some grown man being pushed down the sidewalk by some lady in a baby stroller, you need to point that out to your kids and say, that's weird. Kids, that's not normal. For some passed out drug addict to be pushed down the street in a shopping cart. Kids, weirdos, you need to point that stuff out. These things need to stay separated in their minds. Division is good. Shame is good. It's when you stop feeling shame. It's when sin stops being exceedingly sinful that you know you're in trouble. Look, if sin becomes, if you get out of church and you get out of the Bible and you get out of prayer and you get out of these things in your life, you know what? Sin will stop being exceedingly sinful to you. You're not going to go to hell if you're saved. You're not going to lose your salvation if you're saved. But you need to stay in this spiritual life in a local church that preaches the word of God so you can see that sin. So that sin pops out at you. So shame is, stays real for you. Amen. See, but in order to converge, you have to abandon all these things. You have to abandon all these principles. You have to abandon what? 
You have to abandon the Bible in order to converge. If I went and met with that guy and got together at that organization, that's why these converged organizations that have a religious tone to them, like the Boy Scouts of America, don't even get me started on that. But they're, they have a religious aspect to, but they're an ecumenical organization. They're an ecumenical organization, and guess what? Look, I used to be involved in that organization way back when. And they would get together and they would say these, these gen generic prayers at their big meetings, like, you know, uh, we pray to the God, uh, you know, whatever. And, and then pretty soon, I, I think they even started taking the word God out of it and just talking about a higher power or whatever. And that's like, you know, you get into organizations that are converged like this, like the, like the Masons. You know what the higher power they're talking about? They're talking about Satan higher power. No, there's one God, and he's this God. So we're not going to get together and be ecumenical. We're not going to, because I would have to take, in order to be ecumenical, I'd have to take this and throw it out the window. And then God's going to take and he's going to smash me, is what's going to happen. I'm afraid of that. I should be afraid of that. I am subject to Jesus Christ. So when you hear the Bible preach, and it does kick you in the chest, just, just recognize the structure here. Just recognize what's going on. This is why we will always and must remain independent. And we cannot be in these other organizations. We cannot be together with just anyone. Look, we have friends. We have a lot of friends. We have a lot of churches that we are in fellowship with. But guess what? When Pastor Jimenez comes here, he doesn't say, well, uh, Pastor Bazarnsky, I'm going to preach on this. And when I go preach there, he's like, well, I'd like you to preach on this. And no, he's, he's just, he just, he comes here and he preaches the Bible. And because he's subject to Christ, not me. And I'm subject to Christ, not him. So we have friends, just like the disciples in the Bible have friends. But we are always going to be independent. The Bible says so, but it makes sense, just as the Bible always makes sense. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.